the Skullcrawler is a predator that kills first and doesn't bother with questions later, as it's too busy doing more killing. This kaiju-sized animal is an always hungry, relentless hunter with a bizarre anatomy, only two front limbs, a long, powerful tail, a prehensile tongue, and of course, its iconic skull-like head. But what if this monster wasn't just fiction? What if it actually evolved in real life, living in real ecosystems, hunting real prey, and even crossing paths with humans? This is Evolved Fiction, the series where I take iconic creatures from movies, myths, and games, and reimagine them through the lens of real-world evolution and biology, seeing just how close real life could get to turning fantasy into reality. And today, we will be answering all of those questions and more in this episode of Creature Archives. Let's first lay out the three primary goals for bringing the species to life in a biologically plausible way, while still keeping everything that makes it unmistakably a skull crawler. The first and most important goal is that this species must not only be a massive reptile, but it needs a tripod body plan. That means only two functional forelimbs supported by a long, flexible, and extremely powerful tail that allows it to move, strike, and brace itself while hunting. The second goal focuses on the skull crawler's iconic killing tools, its skull-like head, two rows of sharp hooked teeth, and its strong prehensile tongue. These adaptations allow it to tackle anything from small animals, which it can snatch up with its tongue, to mid-sized or even megafauna-sized prey, using its powerful jaws and constricting tail. And the final goal is this species' unique behavior. And by unique behavior, I mean their incredibly high aggression and need to constantly be on the hunt. Skullcrawlers will kill and hunt anything and everything that moves. And when prey isn't available, they will not hesitate to cannibalize each other. So right off the bat, the first goal presents a big problem. Is it even possible for a species to have a tripod body plan like this? I mean, every other vertebrate in history has four limbs, right? I mean, every vertebrate did at some point have four limbs, but not all vertebrates decide to keep all of them. The primary example of this is, of course, snakes. But snakes actually aren't going to be what we draw from for this. There is actually one living species that has completely lost its hind legs and only has four limbs and a tail. And that is Bipes biporis or as it is more commonly known, the Mexican mole lizard. This tiny lizard is native to northwestern Mexico and southern California, and it is built for a subterranean lifestyle, digging small burrows and hunting insects like ants and termites. Its forelimbs are strong and clawed, specialized for moving through tight tunnels, and its long cylindrical body and tail allow it to push through soil efficiently. While they do have a body plan close to what we're aiming for, they are far too tiny, and other parts of their anatomy, like their skulls, teeth, and leg structure, don't line up well with the skull crawlers. So, we'll be using these lizards as a reference for an instance of convergent evolution, showing how a similar tripod body plan could evolve in a completely different genus. And the genus that lines up perfectly in a lot of ways for a real-life skull crawler is the genus Varanus, the group that includes monitor lizards such as Nile monitors, Komodo dragons, and the extinct species Megalania. This genus provides the best foundation for a skull crawler because they already have the potential for a large reptilian body plan, strong claws and forelimbs, a long, powerful tail, and a skull structure and behaviors that are surprisingly close to a skull crawler's, though we'll get to those last two a bit later. Now, some of you may be aware that technically speaking, skull crawlers are classified under the group Salamandra, making them amphibians rather than reptiles. However, for a real-life version of this species, being a reptile makes much more biological sense. Amphibians simply couldn't reach the massive sizes we're envisioning. Their reliance on skin for breathing becomes a serious limitation as body size increases, and their skeletons, muscles, and limbs aren't built to support such weight. On top of that, most amphibians don't have claws or teeth, so they wouldn't be able to capture or subdue large terrestrial prey. So, going back to monitor lizards, the first recorded Varanus appeared in the Eocene roughly 40 to 50 million years ago. These early monitors were generally small to medium-sized, rarely exceeding a meter or two in length. Larger species didn't begin to appear until the Miocene, when ecological pressures and abundant prey allowed some lineages to grow several meters long. And the larger species like Megalania didn't appear until the Pleistocene. Our skullcrawler lineage will begin its story in Miocene Asia, emerging from a medium-sized Varanus-like ancestor. At this stage, it reached roughly two meters long, and it occupied a burrowing ambush predator niche, think small to medium-sized mammals, reptiles, and birds. Intense competition from other predators and ecological constraints drove its body plan to specialize over time. Losing the hind limbs streamlined its body for moving through tight burrows and confined spaces, allowing it to ambush prey more efficiently underground. 
Its forelimbs became stronger and more muscular, adapted for grappling prey and digging, while its tail grew long, thick, and powerful to provide balance, propulsion, and stability during attacks. By the late Miocene, this tripod stance was fully established. At this point, the species had not yet reached the massive sizes it would later achieve, but it was already an effective ambush predator, capable of hunting mid-sized mammals and reptiles, navigating complex terrain, and exploiting resources that other predators could not. This tripod body plan laid the foundation for later adaptations, including its extreme size, hyper-aggressive behavior, and specialized cranial and tongue adaptations that would eventually define the skull crawler. As the species entered the Pliocene and then the Pleistocene, it not only began to grow to much larger sizes in response to the abundant megafauna surrounding it and as a means of coping with cooler temperatures, but it also developed several other adaptations that refined its hunting abilities. One of the most striking features to evolve in this lineage was a double row of teeth. While some species like the Tuatara have two rows of teeth on the upper jaw, and sharks have rows of continuously replacing teeth, no living species has a structure quite like this. In this species, its two rows of curved hook teeth work in tandem to make escaping its jaws almost impossible. Once it latches onto a victim, the outer row pierces and holds, while the inner row pulls back and tears as the prey struggles. Even if prey manages to twist or pull free, it experiences intense shredding, causing massive amounts of bleeding. This arrangement allowed the skull crawler to tackle larger, stronger prey without relying solely on its forelimbs or tail to subdue them. As the species grew larger, its forked tongue, while still highly sensitive to chemical cues like other monitor lizards, began to serve a second purpose. Being bigger made it harder to reach into small burrows and crevices, so over time the tongue became much stronger, more flexible, and the forked tip became covered in hooked barbs. This tongue is housed in elongated hyoid bones that wrap around the brain case, similar to how a woodpecker's tongue wraps around its skull. This structure not only allows the tongue to impale and secure small prey, but the hyoid also acts as a shock absorber, helping protect the skull and brain from impacts from struggling prey or even megafauna. In response to the violent, brutal encounters with megafauna of the Pleistocene, the skull crawler also develops heavily armored and highly keratinized scales on its face, giving it its iconic skull-like appearance. These reinforced structures allowed it to withstand direct strikes to the head, letting the skull crawler attack more violently and recklessly than other predators. However, this armor came at a cost. Its vision became partially obstructed, causing its eyes to shrink over time. To compensate, it began relying primarily on its sense of smell, tracked through the enhanced sensitivity of its tongue, and it also evolved heat-sensitive organs in its face, similar to the pit organs of vipers. These allow the skull crawler to detect the body heat of prey, even in complete darkness, giving it an incredible advantage during ambush hunting or in the underground burrows where it often striked from. Combined, these adaptations made the skull crawler one of the most efficient and deadly predators of the Pleistocene. However, these adaptations alone didn't make it the terrifying monster that a skull crawler is. That would come from its never-ending hunger and aggressive and ruthless behavior. The skull crawler is the most feared predator on Skull Island for a reason. It is a hypervore, meaning its metabolism keeps it in a near constant state of hunger. This creature is always searching for its next meal, whether that be in the form of an animal, one of its own kind, or even humans. As extreme as that sounds, this type of behavior is not as disconnected from real biology as it may seem. One of the closest modern comparisons comes from the skull crawler's own evolutionary relatives. Komodo dragons are among the most aggressive and opportunistic predators alive today. They readily attack prey larger than themselves, scavenge whenever possible, and show little hesitation in killing and eating smaller Komodo dragons. Juveniles spend much of their early life in trees as a survival mechanism just to avoid being eaten by adults. However, perhaps the closest real-life thing to a hypervore doesn't come from a reptile at all, but rather can be found in shrews. Shrews possess one of the highest metabolic rates of any animal. Their bodies burn energy so rapidly that they must consume their own body weight in food each day, and sometimes even more than this. If they go too long without feeding, they quickly succumb to starvation. This metabolic demand forces them into a constant cycle of hunting, feeding, and movement, producing a life cycle that appears frantic and unusually aggressive for such a small animal. Our real-life skull crawler exhibits a similar metabolic pressure, but scaled to a much larger body size. Unlike its ectothermic reptilian ancestors, this species is not fully cold-blooded. Instead, it evolved a metabolic strategy known as mesothermy. Mesothermy is a middle ground between ectothermy and full endothermy, and is thought to have been present in many dinosaurs. This system allows the skull crawler to generate and retain internal body heat while avoiding the extreme energetic cost associated with warm-blooded animals. This metabolic state provides several critical advantages. 
the Skullcrawler can sustain far higher activity levels than most reptiles, enabling prolonged pursuit, violent ambushes, and repeated attacks on large prey. It can also remain active in cooler climates and during colder seasons, something particularly important during the climatic instability of the Pleistocene. And this physiology creates the fast, aggressive, and relentless attack style that is iconic to the Skullcrawler. However, these benefits come with a significant cost. Maintaining mesothermy in an animal of this size requires a constant and substantial intake of food. The Skullcrawler's metabolism rarely allows it to remain satiated for long. As a result, it is driven to hunt almost continuously, and even turns to cannibalism when prey becomes scarce. Meet Craniosaurus vorax, the voracious skull lizard. This species comes in a wide range of sizes, much like some other reptiles, thanks to indeterminate growth, which means individuals continue growing as long as food is available. But when prey is scarce, they remain smaller, though they will still hunt relentlessly and violently in pursuit of any meal. The largest individuals in this species can reach lengths of up to 10 meters and weigh as much as 4 tons. Most adults tend to max out around 7 meters long and 2.5 and tons. This immense size is only part of what makes Vorax such a formidable predator. Its entire anatomy is optimized for ambush and predation, with a tripod body plan combining two functional forelimbs with a long muscular tail capable of bracing, striking, and constricting attacks. Its head is heavily reinforced with thick, keratinized cranial armor, giving it its iconic skull-like appearance, while its double rows of hooked teeth lock prey in place, making escape nearly impossible. And its barbed prehensile tongue allows it to impale and manipulate smaller prey in ways no other reptile can. Overall, Craniosaurus vorax combines sheer size, brutal aggression, and a suite of specialized hunting adaptations to dominate its environment. Throughout the Pleistocene, Craniosaurus vorax spread far and wide in search of food. Its tripod body plan, combined with a hypervore metabolism, allowed for a surprising amount of maneuverability across a wide range of environments. Strong muscular forelimbs and a powerful tail enabled it to move relatively quickly for a predator of its size, and it could even swim long distances, propelling itself with its tail. This relentless hunger drove the species not only to expand through southern and eastern Asia, but also into neighboring regions, including Indonesia, northern Australia, and Africa. And during a brief window in the Pleistocene, particularly large cold-tolerant individuals were even able to cross the Bering Land Bridge in pursuit of megafauna during the warmer summer months, establishing populations that would spread across North America. Borax is an opportunistic predator that will feed on almost anything it can overpower. Smaller individuals target birds, lizards, small mammals, and even amphibians, using their barbed prehensile tongue to snatch prey from burrows, trees, or dense undergrowth. Mid-sized prey, such as deer and wild boar, are subdued with a combination of grappling forelimbs, constricting tail strikes, and the brutal bite of its hooked, double-rowed teeth. And the largest adults are capable of tackling megafauna. There are accounts of these massive predators ambushing Asian elephants, bison, and rhinos, delivering tearing bites to vulnerable areas such as the legs, throats, or soft underbelly. Once latched on, the Skullcrawler's double rows of teeth and reinforced skull allows it to inflict tremendous bleeding damage, wearing down even the largest prey over the course of an attack. Reproduction in Craniosaurus vorax is entirely opportunistic. Females lay large clutches of eggs, burying them in soil or sand for incubation, and then abandon them immediately. There is no parental care whatsoever. From the moment they hatch, the young are on their own, forced to compete with each other and any other creature they encounter for survival. Instinct and aggression drive their earliest moments, and only the strongest individuals survive to adulthood. Mating in the species is unusual for most reptiles. Craniosaurus vorax is capable of faculative parthenogenesis, meaning females can reproduce asexually if mates are unavailable, though sexual reproduction still occurs when males are present. This ensures that populations can maintain themselves even in isolated or low-density areas, further supporting their wide geographic spread. Vorax is highly adaptable, able to survive in a wide range of habitats from tropical forest and wetlands to savannas and riverine systems. By the end of its Pleistocene expansion, the species had diverged into two primary lineages based on geography and environmental pressures. Craniosaurus vorax orientalis, the Asian lineage, inhabits much of southern and eastern Asia, Indonesia, and parts of Australia and Africa, with plentiful prey supporting the largest individuals and the most aggressive hunting behaviors. Craniosaurus vorax occidentalis, the North American lineage, derived from individuals that cross the Bering Land Bridge, adapt to cooler climates and more seasonal prey availability, which limited their maximum size relative to their Asian cousins. 
These ecological adaptations, combined with their physical and behavioral specializations, made Craniosaurus vorax one of the most formidable and destructive predators the world has seen. From small, highly mobile hunters of rodents and birds, to massive adults capable of taking down elephants, it dominates virtually every ecosystem it enters, demonstrating an unparalleled combination of versatility, strength, and relentless predatory drive. Throughout human history, Craniosaurus vorax has been one of the most feared animals in the world. No creature has ever demonstrated the same combination of aggression, sheer predatory power, and such a willingness to hunt humans. In Asia, stories of encounters with these massive predators span millennia. Ancient communities living near dense forests, river valleys, and floodplains often recorded their encounters in oral histories and cave paintings. These accounts describe enormous skull-faced beasts capable of dragging even large prey into the shadows. In some particularly harrowing records, Morax is documented actively entering human settlements under the cover of night, seizing individuals from tents or huts and dragging them screaming into the darkness. Even more intense were the interactions between Craniosaurus borax and the Colossopithecus rex populations of the Indo-Pacific. No other predator posed as great a threat to their populations as a borax does. Alpha males, armed with crafted spears and axes, defend their troops in face-to-face -face combat against these enormous hunters. These fights are long, dangerous, and critical for the survival of the troop. Colossopithecus, due to its tool use and numbers, were often able to come out victorious in these fights, but rarely without casualties. Across the world in North America, human interactions with this species took on a different mythological role. Native American oral histories describe beings they called skull demons from the underworld, relentless monsters described to emerge from the earth without warning. Many tribes' histories describe being in a constant state of war with this species. Hunting parties would actively hunt and destroy Vorax's young before they could grow large enough to be a threat. Central to these myths was the Thunderbird, considered the primary protector against these underworld forces. Scholars believe this myth may have originated in some truth, from the presence of Trichranus tempest, a massive aerial predator that often hunted voraxes. Records of Trichranus preying on the species during thunderstorms, combined with its dramatic appearance and the coinciding weather events, likely inspired the legend of a guardian capable of bringing both protection and rain. Today, Craniosaurus vorax is extremely rare, surviving only in remote regions with sufficient prey and minimal human disturbance. Its massive size, cannibalistic tendencies, and relentless predatory lifestyle make it especially vulnerable to habitat loss and human conflict. The species is listed as endangered on the IUCN Red List, reflecting the pressures it faces in the modern world. While some groups actively seek to protect these dwindling populations, many people who live in areas where vorax is present strongly oppose any protections. To those in rural or more wild regions, the species is at best a nuisance, preying on livestock and pets. And at worst, it's a very real danger to families. As a result, protective measures like spiked fences with wooden poles driven deep into the ground surrounding villages are common, designed to keep the predators at bay and reduce attacks. The tension between conservation efforts and human safety remains one of the greatest challenges in ensuring the species' survival. But what do you think? If this species were real, do you think it should be protected, left alone, or even exterminated? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Also, if you're not aware, I'm currently holding a fan art submission contest. You can submit art of your favorite evolved fiction creatures for a chance to be featured in an upcoming video in a couple of weeks. Your artwork can depict any evolved fiction creatures on their own, interacting with each other if they live near one another, or interacting with real-life wildlife native to their habitats. And yes, Craniosaurus vorax is now included as an option. Submissions are due by January 25th, so make sure to get your art in by then. If you're interested, click the link in the pinned comment below to read the details and submit your fan art. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like and subscribe, and a big shout out to all of my YouTube members. Until next time, stay curious, and I'll see you all in the next video.